uh, to the new faces here. Uh, we welcome you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, Okay. Um, okay, we'll get to it then. Um, my name is Nina Marian. I'm formerly the executive director of an organization called the Coalition for Civil Freedoms. It's a survivor-led organization that advocates on behalf of 265 political <coughs> prisoners targeted in the U.S. war on terror. Uh, we were founded in 2010, and our mission is to defend civil liberties and freedoms, promote a fair U.S. criminal justice system, and advocate for the rights of political prisoners uh, in the U.S. targeted in the so-called war on terror. Um, our definition of a Muslim political prisoner is a person who was targeted, criminally prosecuted, and imprisoned due to their political views, beliefs, associations, cultural identity, or activism. Um, since October 7th, we've witnessed Israel carry out with impunity a genocidal war and dehumanization campaign against Palestinians in Gaza with the full backing of the U.S. government and media. For more than seven months, our communities have been glued to their screens, witnessing in real time the horrors unfold in Gaza. Feeling helpless to stop the ongoing atrocities, our anger and emotions understandably are at an all-time high. At the same time, we've experienced a resurgence of mass hysteria, fear-mongering, and anti-Muslim hate to levels not seen since 9-11. Tragically, it didn't take long for the racist rhetoric of the U.S. media and politicians to have deadly consequences, as we saw in the murder of six-year-old Palestinian boy, Wadir Al-Fayyumi, just a week after uh, the war on Gaza began, and then the subsequent shooting of the three students in Vermont. But the reason we're convening today is because as many of us as Muslim Americans have witnessed since 9-11, each time the U.S. prosecutes a war uh, overseas or funds it, it simultaneously wages a domestic war on targets in the U.S. in our own communities. Uh, we've seen many politicians try to criminalize uh, pro-Palestine speech, try to de you know, dub a label pro-Palestine rallies as Hamas rallies and so forth. We've seen uh, the pro-Israel groups uh, try to sit the FBI, DHS on ICE on our communities, as have politicians. Um, these agencies are, in fact, designed to infiltrate threatened communities, manufacture crimes, and quash dissent. As the government wages its war on terror 2.0, we at CCF are grateful to work with FBI whistleblower Terry Alvary on what we hope will be a series of events uh, to warn communities of the government targeting that has already begun and educate ourselves on how to protect our rights. As a former agent of almost 20 years, Terry can provide intimate knowledge that very few can. Think of it as a know your rights, but with first-hand knowledge of exactly how the government operates. Uh, joining us here also is Kathy Manley, our legal director, who stumbled upon this work by chance when she represented a falsely accused imam in Albany, New York, named Yassin Adin. His case changed her life as she saw the FBI blatantly and deliberately set up an innocent man and frame him on terrorism charges. 20 years later, Kathy is still fighting for this cause, and she recently won um, a compassionate release motion for four men who were wrongfully targeted and convicted sentenced to 25 years in a case that their own judge deemed the un-terrorism case. We have next to me Sarwat Malik from New Jersey, who is the political advocacy director at CCF, who is leading our community outreach work. Um, as I mentioned, Terry Albury on our panel is a former FBI agent of 17 years who blew the whistle in 2017 on the FBI's targeting of Muslim communities as a matter of policy. Basically, everything that we believed that they were doing uh, was confirmed in meticulous detail through a trove of internal documents that were leaked. These revelations were studied and published as part of a series of articles in The Intercept called The FBI Secret Rules. I highly encourage you to read them. Um, following his exposure as the whistleblower, Terry was prosecuted by the U.S. government for his courageous truth-telling and sentenced to four years in prison after accepting a plea deal. Um, now I want to turn it to Kathy to take us back to that early post 9-11 climate, describing the landscape, the impact of the Patriot Act, and why CCF was formed. 
and what you found in your own research into terrorism prosecutions. Sure. Yeah, so it's been 20 years since I first got involved in this. In 2004, with the arrest of Yasin Araf and his co-defendant in Albany, New York, I was an attorney with a law firm that ended up being assigned the case. Um, and um, I realized after a while that Yasin was totally innocent and I hadn't really seen that before in these federal prosecutions. And <clears throat> basically they targeted him based on false evidence. They thought he was somebody else. We still don't really know because that was all secret was given to the judge and the defense never got to see it. But we found out later that the person that they thought he was was killed in 2010. So it's obviously not him. Um, and they must have realized that like pretty quickly, but they used it, they continued to use it because they wanted to go after him and in a sting operation. And usually with sting operations, an informant will, using various promises, uh, coercion, manipulation, will get the targets to say something bad on tape and then they use that against them. Yes, he never even did that. He said he is he's a good Muslim. He's promised to obey the law in this country because that's what you have to do when you come here. And he wants to help widows and orphans that are under attack, but he can't support any terrorist groups. And he didn't say anything that was problematic on the tapes. He only said good things. But because um, of the secret evidence, the judge told the jury that there were good and valid reasons for targeting him. And so, of course, they were afraid to acquit him because what if they acquitted him and then something happened? So they, he and his co-defendant who was entrapped and still didn't really support terrorism, but I can't go into that because there's not time. They both got sentenced to um, 15 years. It would have been 30 years under the sentencing guidelines, but because the community supported them so much and we did a good defense of them as best as we could under the circumstances, they get 15 years and we could never get them out before that. They both finished those sentences now and they're out and they're doing okay. Yassin got deported, he's Kurdish in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, but after that, so after the trial, a bunch of us came together and we started looking at other cases to see if this was just an isolated example or were there other cases, because we knew that there was a lot of unfair things going on after 9-11. We could see the climate of fear and it definitely played into the case we had just been through. So we started looking at other cases and we started studying them. We started a group called Project Salam in Albany. And then we learned about, um, well, actually we got um, uh, Sami al Lina's brother Ali came to find us in Albany and invited us and said, look, my, my father is under house arrest in Virginia because Dr. Sami was in, involved in a similar case, which he beat most of the charges because there was no evidence and luckily he had a decent jury that wasn't so terrorized by the climate of fear that they actually looked for evidence and they actually acquitted him of almost everything. But the case still drug, dragged on for a long time and we don't have time to go into that either. But basically he was under house arrest in Virginia under a uh, Virginia because the earlier case was in Florida. Then Virginia was still going after him in a perjury trap. He was under house arrest and he realized that we have to do something about these cases happening all over the country. So he contacted us in Albany and people all around the country. And so we all came together. We had to come to him because he was under house arrest. So we got together in his apartment, where his daughter's apartment, where he was living in Alexandria, Virginia, I think, and um, formed CCF in 2010. And then we um, studied 600 convictions that the US government termed terrorist convictions. And we found out that only 15 of them were like actual acts of terrorism or even attempted terrorism against the US. 95% um, of them had what we call elements of preemptive prosecution. And that's what we discovered. Steve Downs, my colleague in Albany, also was involved in the founding of CCF. He's another attorney. Um, he said, look, what they're doing is they're trying to go after people before they commit a crime because they want to theoretically prevent another 9-11, right? So they're trying to find out who's suspicious, who might do something and find ways to target them, deport them or charge them with the crime before they even do anything. Because, And in most of those cases, I mean, the FBI has no idea about Islam, about um, 
who's actually a threat and who's not. They just see it all as a threat, and Terry can talk about that. But um, so they just target people who haven't done anything. And so 93, 93% of the cases that we studied of the 600 convictions had a, a strong elements of preemptive prosecution to them. There was no violence involved, no even attempted violence, unless it was manufactured by an FBI informant. And 70% of the cases were entirely preemptive, where there was no real crime going on at all. It was either purely a sting operation, or it was some kind of vague conspiracy for guilt by association, or material support to terrorism charges, where there were like charitable contributions, where um, there was no intent to support violence. And so I'll just talk about a few examples. Um, so the Holy Land Foundation case, this was the largest Muslim charity based in Texas, was supporting um, desperately needed, giving desperately needed aid to people all over the world, including in Palestine and in Gaza. And they were giving money to, to um, the same the like cut committees that the U.S. government was giving money to, but because they were Palestinian, basically um, they got targeted for prosecution for material support, arguing that they were trying to support Hamas. They weren't even giving money to Hamas, but the first trial was a mistrial, and then they all got convicted. Two of them got sentenced to 65 years, and they're just like the best humanitarians in the world, Shukra Abu Bakr and Kassan Alashi. We're trying to help them, but um, there isn't really anything we can do for them legally right now. Um, so we're just hoping that there's some opening and we're trying to educate the people about the case. Um, but it's 65 years, yeah. If I didn't say that, I meant to say that, yeah. And they were, <coughs> they were in their 40s or something at the time, so that's a life sentence. Um, and then the Newberg case, which Lena mentioned, which is where we, we did recently win compassionate release. <coughs> and that was a sting operation where the targets didn't even have any interest in anything political or religious or anything. They were just offered $250,000 in one case or $5,000 and they had nothing. They were totally down and out and didn't even have driver's licenses, didn't even have jobs in some cases. And one was severely mentally ill. Um, so they were totally trapped, and the judge was always critical of the case, so she was always sympathetic, but because the jury convicted them, she felt like she couldn't throw that conviction out, she should have, but she didn't. And um, so after um, it became possible to file compassionate release motions, we did that for them, and um, luckily it was granted, and so they've all been released now, except the one that's mentally ill is being civilly confined by the Bureau of Prisons, which is another nightmare. But um, anyway, and then there's the case of Reswan Ferdels, who's a young man living in Boston who um, was in uh, college for engineering, but he developed schizophrenia or some kind of very severe mental illness where he was delusional and he was unable to function at all and his father was trying to get him to see a psychiatrist. But meanwhile, the FBI informant was targeting him in a sting operation, trying and trying to get him to agree to do some kind of attack. And the informant was like giving him all these ideas for it and everything. And it was like his only friend at this point. And then when he finally started seeing a psychiatrist and started medication, that's when they said, we gotta move in and arrest him because he's gonna back out of this once he gets better. And so they arrested him and he got like 20 something years. So actually we have somebody working on a compassionate release motion for him too. But a lot of the people that are targeted do have various vulnerabilities that like mental illness or some kind of thing that makes them susceptible to an informant. Um, so I guess this has been going on, even our report only went up through 2015, but it's been going on since then, maybe a little bit fewer cases. But now, since October 7th, we're afraid that there may be a new uptick because of <clears throat> all the uh, harassment of people who support Palestine. Um, thanks, Kathy. So you worked on the uh, defense side. Uh, Terry was on the other side of this. So could you give us um, your experience after 9-11? Um, you know, giving us the landscape at the time uh, from your perspective as the agent knocking on the door and uh, being assigned in Muslim communities. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you guys for having us. For real. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think overall, I listened to Lena in the beginning. Um, you know, why we're here today is to give context, right? Because the war on terrorism started officially after 9 11. Um, but the actions of the U.S. government and the Muslim community has been going on for decades prior to that. Um, and so I think it's important for all of us that really have a deep knowledge of history of what the government's been doing in our communities, the manner in which they view the Muslim community as this perpetual existential type of threat, which then allows them to create this entire apparatus that says anyone from these countries, anyone with these demographics fit the bill and should be treated as a perpetual other. Um, when you travel overseas, when you communicate with your friends and family, whatever it is, all of that is looked at as something nefarious. And I think over time, right, you know, within the community, there's been this notion perhaps that, well, that was 11 times have changed, we've slowly assimilated into the culture and, you know, perhaps because we are the, deemed to be the good ones, right, because the government likes to sort of create this dichotomy of good Muslims, bad Muslims, right? Um, because of that, if we toe the party line and we don't say anything overly political, that will be used as a basis to somewhat insulate us, right, and, and we don't have to worry about being targeted. But um, one thing that I've, I really try to reinforce as a message with um, people with whom I speak um, is, in my experience in the FBI, 17 plus years there, it was very clear when I joined, Islam is the enemy, right? They drew a very clear line. And because of that, anyone of the Islamic faith, anyone from these particular countries was deemed to be a target and it became open season. And so I think we have to really understand like, you know, CCF, the work that they do to support those who have been unjustifiably targeted, incarcerated, uh, entrapped, um, that can easily be any of us, right? I could be your son, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, whomever, um, because there is just this understanding institutionally that um, to target this community, um, the, the threshold is quite low, um, and there's a lot of legal maneuvering that happens within the organization that allows, again, you know, we, we learn about our rights, your First Amendment right to speak freely. Well, if you're Muslim, that comes with a caveat. You, you, you can say certain things, but if you say it, it's going to be met with a reciprocal response of, you're gonna end up on the list, and then you might have an FBI agent come out at your door. More than likely, you're going to have to worry about being scrutinized by border patrol when you travel. Um, these are realities. And so understanding how you should navigate, given that reality, is extremely critical, um, lest you kind of be lulled into this false sense of security about what your rights are and what you can do in this landscape. Thanks, Terry. So many have described the current climate now as a resurgence of some of the worst policies um, what can you uh, share in, in terms of what um, what the, the war again on Israel's war on Gaza is doing to communities here and how it'll affect us in terms of surveillance, targeting, um, and securitization? What is the general mood of the FBI? And you know, I know that that was mentioned a lot in the New York Times article. Mm -hmm. Some of those conversations that they were having. So, what is their actual view of the Muslim? and what is happening now, as you see? Yeah, I mean, you know, whatever happens overseas, right, whether it's in Palestine, whether it's in Pakistan, whether it's in Iraq, Afghanistan, all of that is used as a basis to then, because the FBI covers domestic operations, that is used then to, whatever the military is doing overseas, in waging their war and oppressing and, you know, exporting imperialism, all over the world is then turned here domestically on communities that are deemed to be a threat. 
um, with the FBI will often do, you know, um, I, I told Lena and others here about, they call it domain mapping, um, which is FBI jargon for if you have a community from a particular population, that community now is authorized to be targeted. Targeted in the sense of, well, I have, you know, a population of people from Yemen, right, in, in the suburb of Georgia. Well, what I'm going to do now is pull all of their biographical data from Border Patrol, from Customs, from ICE, from IRS, and I'm going to start targeting them for interviews, for secondary screenings, for surveillance, and for informant recruitment. And then what you're going to see is, if you recently traveled overseas, for instance, you'll have an FBI agent come to your door the following day or a couple days after and say, hey, you just traveled to this country. What were you doing over there? You know, I have information. Um, and so, you know, I think for a lot in the community that come from other countries, right, where you have a secret police, there's an understanding culturally of what the governments over there do, right? Torture, disappear, kidnap, things of that nature. The FBI preys on that fear. They prey on that ignorance. Can they, in this climate, in this, under our current laws, do those exact same things? No. But they also capitalize on the ignorance that the community has of their rights, and they use that to then compel and force cooperation and compliance with questioning, with the notion that you really have no other option but to you know, essentially be their friend and to associate and, and to agree to certain things in furtherance of their overall objective. So to the question, in light of what's happening in Palestine and, and sort of the, the war being waged against the Palestinian people by Israel, the FBI absolutely is now actively in communities, knocking on doors, telling young children, you know, we see a lot of students in college who are actively opposing the genocide and, and saying this cannot be sanctioned. And they're not all Muslims either, right? There are a lot of Western kids. But you couple that with the fact that, you know, there's a global outrage to what's happening. And because of that, that gives the FBI, because they've designated, you know, with the State Department and, and uh, IRS uh, Treasury, that, Hamas is a foreign terrorist organization. So anything, because they take their lead from Israel, anything that is viewed as supporting the resistance, calling for the end of the occupation, is viewed as material support for terrorism, which then allows the government to go into your communities, insert informants, knock on your doors, conduct surveillance, you know, go through your, even your trash, right? I mean, like, I've, I've been the guy at three in the morning going through someone's trash, right? And pulling receipts, right? And then using that information from the receipt to then conduct investigative action. So, you know, again, this is not paranoia. I think that for a long time, a lot of us have sort of become desensitized probably to these realities, but it's not, you know, we're not here to engage in fear mongering and to create this climate that you should, you know, look over your shoulder at all times, but just understand the threat landscape and the fact that, you know, living in this country, being a member of the Islamic community, you are viewed as a perpetual fifth column in the eyes of the government, and you should respond accordingly however you see fit with that knowledge. So I wanted to ask you, Terry, and let me know if you guys can't hear me. Basically, um, you know, on, based on conversations that we had before, um, I wanted you to address the fact that you don't have to be Palestinian. You don't even have to be an activist. You don't have to necessarily be this big, you know, outspoken uh, advocate on a political issue. And yet we've been seeing a lot of Muslim communities partner uh, with Israel, you know, pro-Israel Zionist organizations um, thinking that you can come together on so-called interfaith um, dialogue and so forth. But in fact, a lot of these same groups, such as the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, 
have a uh, relationship you know, uh, with the FBI where they essentially have them on speed dial and Palestinians aren't their only targets. And you've told me about that before, you know, in terms of what kind of like vague tips can the FBI act on and how has the ADL played this role in sicking the FBI on anybody in the Muslim community? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a very close relationship historically with the ADL and the FBI and various Zionist Israeli interests within the U.S. government, um, APAC, being one of them. Um, it's not paranoia, right? I mean, I personally received, when I was working in Minnesota in the Somali community, received a referral from the local ADL office saying, hey, you know, we have this individual here who was, I mean, the guy was literally just sitting in a park near uh, a Jewish temple, and that was used as a basis for them to say this person was deemed to be a threat, right? So then the, the directive from my superiors were, okay, you need to go into this individual and conduct whatever investigative action is necessary. Identify their name, pull up their DMV, their home address, their work, whatever it is, in order to support this mutually beneficial relationship, right? Because it's, it's one of those situations where, you know, they scratch the FBI's back and the FBI scratches their back. There's a lot of exchange in terms of personnel, resources, um, intelligence, as they call it, between the FBI, the U.S. government, and the Israelis. Um, I talked yesterday about how there's a one-year intensive Arabic training program in Tel Aviv where agents go over to Israel and they learn Arabic. But they also, in learning Arabic, they learn Israeli counterterrorism tactics. They learn how the laboratory that is the occupied territories, how they treat Palestinians over there is in what they export here. And again, the same view, the same threat mindset, you know, because you hear the narrative, the propaganda from the Israeli authorities are, oh, well, there's no innocent person in Palestine, right? No, everyone is culpable in one way, shape, or fashion, and that's how they're able to rationalize the genocidal actions. So the same mentality is exported here in the FBI, where it's like, okay, well, the Muslim community, collectively, they too are threatening, they too warrant this level of suspicion and scrutiny and attention and the FBI is more than willing to do that. Thanks, uh, Terry. And I wanted to add a quick story about the digging in the trash. My mom used to tell the story that um, one early morning, my father was traveling, and a police officer showed up at like 6, 7 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And we were all asleep, and he's banging on the door. And she comes to answer, and he says, your neighbor who's all the way down the other block is complaining that you keep throwing your trash in his dumpster or, you know, his trash bin. And she's like, that's not, it's like, it's been happening. And she said, my son is too lazy to take the trash from the front of the garage all the way down to the street. He's not about to take it all the way, you know, blocks away to our neighbor's bin. And sure enough, years later, after my father's arrest, um, we had an entire exhibit list called Trash, which is all the agents just digging through our trash for years. Um, so I want to talk to you, Kathy, about what communities should be um, on the lookout for uh, in terms of targeting now in the post 10-7 context, you know, that the government is now getting a surge of money influx uh, in the FBI and these agencies. How are they going to use it? Well, there's a couple of bills. I mean, there's various things they're doing, um, but there's a couple of bills uh, pending in Congress right now that are some that we should be opposing that are making an already bad situation worse. And one is called the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. And basically, it adopts a definition of anti-Semitism that equates criticizing Israel with um, anti-Semitism, even though there's a lot of Jews that are criticizing Israel, so they're getting accused of anti-Semitism, right? Under this definition, uh, groups like Jewish Voice for Peace and others. Um, and 
it would be mainly in the education context. So it would be used with like federal anti-discrimination laws to ban a lot of speech critical of Israel on college campuses and in schools in general. And it could be used in some other organizations too. And schools not going along with it could lose federal funding. So it passed the House. We'll see if it passes the Senate. So we should oppose that with our senators, contact our senators. Another one is, um, so there's already um, ways for the government to shut down not-for-profit organizations if they sue them and allege that they're supporting a designated terrorist organization. And they did that to the Holy Land Foundation. There was a whole civil trial even before the criminal trial. And it was completely unfair based on false evidence from Israel, but that's a whole other story. So that's not even a fair process. But now there's this bill that would um, that also passed the House in the Senate. It's Senate bi uh, Resolution or Senate Bill 3136, and it would allow the Treasury Department to just on its own, without going to court, um, strip the not for profit status of any charity just by claiming, without any due process, that it supports terrorism without any evidence of any connection to a designated group, just whenever they feel like saying it. And the reason this is happening is directly related to the resistance to Israel's war right now, because it's aimed directly, according to its sponsors, groups like Students for Justice in Palestine and Americans, wait, American Muslims for Palestine, I always forget that we're AMP. And um, they said, we have to go after these groups, and this is why we're doing this. So between those two bills, that's going to give them even more tools than they already have to go after people who are standing up to what Israel's doing. Um, so we need to oppose both of those and, and just be aware of this and be aware of the material support laws because um, they're very broad and Hamas is a designated organization. You know, it's, the designation process is not fair. It's whatever groups the U.S. government doesn't like because there's so many groups all over the world. They only designate the ones that they don't like politically, right? Um, and so um, anybody that has any connection or gives any kind of support to any of those groups can be prosecuted for material support. The Supreme Court ruled in 2010 in the Humanitarian Law Project case that even groups who were trying to work with designated, so-called designated terrorist organizations to get them to try to work out their grievances peacefully, to learn how to participate in international negotiating processes and things like that through the UN, um, that was termed material support to terrorism. The Supreme Court said, yeah, you can't do that. So um, it's used very broadly. And so you have to be careful what you say. If, if you know you say something about supporting Hamas, you could get in trouble for that. For, even though you supposedly have a First Amendment right to say that, there's been cases where people have put things on the internet, and then the government would say that's material support to terrorism because that terrorist group, even if you're not directly in contact with it, could download that from the internet. So you're connecting with them through the, this vast internet, right? So you got to be careful of that and um, just be careful what you say. Don't get caught up in emotion and post things on social media that can be used to target you. But also don't be quiet either. Find ways to say it that, you know, it's kind of a fine line, but we don't want to scare people into shutting them up because we've learned over a long experience uh, through history and through our own experiences that when people stand up and speak out, it ends up better for them than if they just get scared and get quiet. If you get scared and get quiet, they're going to come after you more and more and more. And one example, or if you bow down to what they're doing, one example of that recently is the college presidents that were called before these like new McCarthy hearings in Congress, where these, my crazy congressperson, Elise Stefanik in upstate New York, she's crazy. She goes after them and accuses them of being terrorists for, for allowing the students to chant from the river to the sea or something like that, and saying, isn't that terrorism, isn't that terrorism? And if they say, oh yes, that's terrorism, guess what, then they lose their jobs. They lose their jobs or they unleash the NYPD against the Columbia students, like happened with the Columbia president. She did not, that did not end up well for her. She's not going to have that job, I don't think, much longer. Because she bowed down to it, and she 
created a much worse situation for herself. But then when they brought in, um, the last week or so, they brought in K through 12 school leaders, administrators, and they tried these same tactics on them. But they kind of, they saw what happened and they kind of stood up to it and pushed back. And it's not, they're doing much better. They're looking much better and they're starting to make these Congress people that are doing this look bad. So it's, it works out better if you can stand up and fight back, but you have to do it smart, smartly. You have to be I also careful. want to yeah. add, um, in Albany, I mean, we've seen so many sting operations, entrapment cases against Muslim targets uh, all around the country, a lot of times repeated in the same communities. But in those communities, when people uh, kind of shun the, the families of the, the prisoners, they didn't want to get involved, the government continued to pursue more cases. In Albany, where Kathy was in that case of the imam, um, because the community stood up and fought back, they never dared to pursue another uh, case in that, in that. And in fact, they got the local uh, city council to pass a resolution condemning the FBI for its actions in a series of you know, statements that were very powerful that this wasn't welcome there. Um, so one thing I wanted you to touch on, uh, uh, Kathy, that we talked about last night is also what kind of uh, person is, you know, is a potential target. Now, a lot of people thought that the war on terror had ended. You know, they weren't hearing about these cases because they were targeting the most vulnerable people, people that, you know, are not the leaders in our communities that are, you know, not, you know, wealthy. They aren't the, the visible ones, um, but they're still a part of the Muslim community. Um, and to, to talk about also, um, the fact that, um, you know, what, what vulnerabilities they may have uh, to make them targets. Yeah. Um, that, and one thing I, I do want to add is that um, we're seeing part of the inspiration for us wanting to do this is the fact that we are all, you're seeing youths exposed to genocide, you know, the most uh, atrocious uh, crimes and horrific images that they're becoming angry. And what is it that, you know, can radicalize a person to want to, to, to be a vulnerable target of the government that can come in there and prey on these emotions to get them to go along with a fake plot. And so that's part of what we want to warn communities about. So if you can talk about what that targeting looks like, you know, what the, the, the you know, intended target is, um, you know, and, and shed light on that. Yeah, even before October 7th, we noticed a trend where I think a lot of people in the Muslim community were getting a little smarter about avoiding these informants. And so they were looking, they started looking more for mentally ill young people and targeting them because they could manipulate some of them more easily. And, 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 yeah, and, and teenagers. So we know of several cases in the last year or so where they targeted teenagers for a few years and then after they turned 18, arrested them on um, terrorism charges and a sting operation. So an informant would be kind of preying on them, grooming them, so to speak, um, for years. So one case is this year, um, Alexander Mercurio, um, the FBI preyed on him for about two or three years while he was suffering from severe mental illness and his parents kept trying to get him into counseling. He jumped around from like, white supremacists to supporting ISIS to just look, looking for anything provocative, I guess, because of his mental illness. And um, finally, when he turned 18, the, they arrested him on a plot because the informant had convinced him to agree to a suicide bombing because he was suicidal. He was like, well, what if you're going to kill yourself, why don't you take somebody with you? Something like that, instead of getting him help. So he's now facing like 20 years on a material support charge. And I also know that these people with mental illness in prison, especially when they're really young, they have a much harder time in prison because they can't follow the stupid rules. Like they're gonna always get in trouble. They're, they're gonna get abused because the guards know nobody's gonna believe them. It's really a horrible situation. So we've been seeing that already. Um, and then since October 7th, we're worried that um, with the students who are justifiably very outraged about what's going on, that some of them could be vulnerable to informants also. And maybe Terry could talk about the kind of, well, the kind of leverages that informants use and the kind of tactics that they use. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, informants are, it's huge, right? It's the bread and butter of the FBI. And I venture to say in every mosque in this country, there's at least one or two. Um, and that's not to, and again, instill this fear, but just I think that awareness is critical because one thing the FBI excels at is preying on vulnerabilities. It gets money, right? You find a guy who's struggling to find a job, and so it's like, hey, give me a few dollars, I'll give you a stipend every few weeks if you just attend this mosque and you know where a video and audio recorder and just tell me what's going on. Tell me who the leaders are, who's coming to visit. You know, uh, I personally have done that. You know, I've wired people up and sent them into mosques, you know. Um, so there's definitely an a environment within the organization that looks to exploit any vulnerability um, in furtherance, again, of justifying this narrative, the internal narrative institutionally, that the Muslim community poses this grand threat to the safety and security of the United States and the world in general. Um, and so, you know, there's various levers that can be pulled. Um, I talk a lot about, you know, crossing the border, right? Um, once you leave, um, if you're flying internationally and you cross over through customs, even in, in, that, in the terminal, you are technically overseas. And so what the U.S. can do through CBP is go through your phone, go through your, your laptop, your iPad, your digital devices, and extract the information and then use that in terms of running those what they call selectors in various databases and saying, hey, or you have phone contact with someone that you deem to be a threat, right? And so you, you go on the defensive. I don't think I know anyone that's suspicious, but that's used to create, again, internal conflict within yourself to then say, okay, I, I probably should clear this up because if I don't, it's gonna be worse for me. I, I might be delayed traveling. I might be on the no-fly list potentially or what's known as the selectee list, which is far, far larger um, and not as well known as in the fly list. But the select e list is essentially anyone, um, if you travel and you're deemed to be someone of interest, they pull you out, it's called a secondary inspection, and they can go through all of your, um, your luggage and whatever else in hopes of gathering some information with the understanding that potentially maybe we'll convert you into a, a snitch um, and use you in furtherance of, you know, the FBI's operations and or the CIA's operations, you know. There's a great deal of collaboration between those agencies because the CIA technically is prohibited from operating domestically, but the reality is that they work in hand very intimately with the FBI to further their agenda in order to identify people that they can send overseas to various countries in an undercover capacity. And, and that's one thing that's often overlooked, but it, it happens, um, happened in my time. I can guarantee it's happening now. Can you talk about, because obviously we're all on social media, we're all online, even if we're not in the streets demonstrating, um, you know, can you talk about the undercover FBI agents that are swarming the internet trying to find potential targets there, how that works, um, and how people can protect themselves from uh, being targets online. Yeah, you know, there's, um, last night I mentioned, um, there's a program within the FBI called Online Covert Employees, there's the formal name, OCEs, um, and they're essentially undercover FBI employees, agents, whatever else, who troll Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the social media platforms, create profiles, and then they create this persona, which then is designed to ensnare those, you know, as Lena mentioned, because we're in a very emotionally charged environment and you know we, we can't turn away, we shouldn't turn away um, to what is obviously incredibly disgusting and outrageous and just shocks the human conscience of what Israel's doing. And so they use that as a basis to then say, hey, well, you know, 
so-and-so, you've got an Instagram, I'm gonna start, maybe, I'll start following you online, and I'll start liking your tweets, and I'll start, you know, um, sending you information with the purpose of potentially developing a relationship with that person, to then take that relationship offline, meet them in person, and then start targeting them for either recruitment and or potential prosecution. So, you know, it's, no one is who they say they are online anyway, right? I mean, I think we, we've grown up with the internet enough where you, you can't trust what you see, but at the same time, you know, you have to live this level of self-awareness and scrutiny and really, um, you know, as I say, trust but verify, right? Someone says they're from your same village, right? Or someone says they're from your city, um, but the reality is until you really know who they are and you had a chance to really assess them um, personally, um, you can't trust them. And I think that the FBI, that they're effective at exploiting the trust in the Islamic community. Um, it's very open, embracing, accepts outsiders, right? You, you want to be hospitable. Um, and so they know that and they, they capitalize on those cultural norms in the hopes of then using that as a basis to identify people to, to prey on. Um, and so I don't want you to feel like, hey, I have to kind of watch what I say and self-censor. You still have rights, you still can engage in First Amendment protected activity, right, free speech. But there's always that caveat of what you say is gonna be filtered through a different lens because again, the US government views your ideology, your politics, as inherently problematic, counter to their views, right? Because you know, if you're living in this country, you should support everything that it does, right? You should support its imperial adventures all over the globe. You should support its war on drugs. You should support anything that it, it advances. And, and that's, I think, for those of us who are educated and, and critical thinkers, we recognize that not everything that America is good and that doesn't make you a bad American. But that's the narrative that's put forth to then create this climate where you have to feel as though you can't be open and honest about your views and, and your perspectives. Thank you. Um, so uh, since October 7th, uh, our organization has gotten contacted by people, uh, activists, students who felt that um, they've been infiltrated um, a, a couple have expressed that they kind of ignored red flags until it became really apparent that this person was trying to set them up into something nefarious. Um, so can you give, and this is a question for both you and Kathy, um, Kat, we've of course tracked numerous cases and seen some patterns of informants, but what are some red flags uh, our audience here can look out for to recognize that you know somebody's intentions may not be that pure? Um, and then um, if, if you yourself have been targeted by the government to be recruited as an informant, um, what can you do to resist that if you feel like your back is to the wall, like they have something on you? And the third part of that question is what does the FBI do when they no longer deem you useful as an informant? Or you know you decide that you have a you know, crisis of conscience, you don't wanna do this anymore are you protected necessarily by being an informant? So red flags, um, and yeah, I'm just repeating it. And yeah, so go ahead. You give me a lot at once. Yes, um, yes. Let me uh, address the last one first. Okay. So what happens when you no longer have value as a snitch, right? Um, there was a, uh, I think it was in the New Yorker, um, a journalist did a documentary, a short documentary, um, entitled No Longer Suitable for Use. And the documentary follows the case. It's, a, it's fictional, but it, it speaks to a real event where the FBI recruited an informant, used this person for a specified period of time, and then the case was over and they said, we no longer need you. Um, at the end, this individual was discarded in the sense of, they no longer had affiliation, but then that person was then ultimately the informant who did all this, what the FBI deems good work, 
they ended up passing this information on to immigration, and immigration said, well, you no longer have status in this country, you're going to be deported, right? Um, the FBI is very effective at, at exploiting those vulnerabilities, and there is documented evidence which discusses how to exploit whether it's immigration, right? You're going to see USCIS, right? Because you're trying to get naturalized or you're trying to get a family member over. Well, USCIS will work with the FBI to pass information that you share with them and then use that to then say, hey, well, we're going to apply pressure and say, well, if you don't cooperate, you're not going to receive status. You will not be allowed to naturalize. You won't be able to bring your wife or your husband your niece or nephew from overseas. So the person their back is against the wall and say, okay, I'm going to cooperate. Um, what's your other questions? Yeah, yeah, no, no, not at all. Um, I, actually, I want Kathy to answer this because we do have a case where a person was an informant and no longer wanted to be. So if you could talk about that, um, that you're not protected. Yeah, we had somebody who was an informant and he stopped being an informant, and then they targeted him in the case, and he got a really long sentence. But basically, whatever whatever leverage they have against you to get you to be an informant in the first place, if they ever become displeased with you anyway, in any way, they're going to use that leverage against you anyway. So it's better to just not become an informant in the first place. It's not going to really help you unless you want to just do it for the rest of your life and be under their thumb for the rest of your life, which is not a good idea. Um, so if, somebody, if somebody's targeted for recruitment um, and they don't want to do it, but they feel threatened, how should they handle that? Yeah, they should reach out to one of us or any lawyer that they know, and if they don't have a lawyer that they trust, they should reach out to myself or Amit Gupta, who's one of our lawyers who lives here in Atlanta. And his um, email is amith, A-M-I-T-H, at civilfreedoms.org. Mine is Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y, at civilfreedoms.org. Um, and, you know, we can help you. Um, the easier thing is if the FBI, should I talk about that, like if not talking to the FBI? Yeah, yeah, if the FBI course. just shows up at your door or calls you or emails you and wants to talk to you, and, and they'll just say, oh, this is just friendly. You're not, we don't see you as a threat. We just want to talk to you. We're just doing outreach in your neighborhood. They say that a lot. Um, and they, you know, they want to take advantage of your hospitality because you want to let people in and give them tea or something. And um, don't do that with the FBI because they're trying to get you to be an informant or to get information from you um, even without formally being an informant. And there's different levels of being an informant, too. I should say that there's one is just somebody that, oh, let us know if you see anything or anybody suspicious or have you seen this person before? Just tell us about this or, you know, get information from you, which then they can use with other information and, and use it in whatever way they want. The, the other level of being an informant is when you're actually a provocateur and you actually wear a wire and try to get somebody to commit a so-called crime to, to say something bad on tape and then they'll use that so those are two different things but they're looking for both um they have a lot of people who give them information um they have fewer people who will wear wires but that's why they keep using some very bad ones over and over but um anyway um so if the fbi shows up there's going to be two of them, and if you agree to talk to them, they're legally allowed to lie to you, so you can't believe anything they say, but if they claim that you're lying to them, then you can be prosecuted for making a false statement to the FBI, and you can even sometimes get a terrorism enhancement for that if they deem that it's related to terrorism, so you can do a lot of time in prison for that. So, and they don't record the interviews, even though most police agencies across the country do record interviews now, because there's been like laws passed. The FBI still doesn't, right? They still don't, because it's just not how they operate. They want to be able to um, twist what you say, to um, say, they want to be able to say what you say when there's two of them and one of you. Um, they'll also have multiple meetings, and if there's any discrepancies, they'll use that against you. So it's really easy to not talk to them. Um, was anybody who was there last night tell me what you do? 
some of you were there last night. What do you do if they come to your door? Come on, anybody? Yeah, yeah. what do you say to them? Uh, Give me your business card. Your card, yes. And I'll have my lawyer, lawyer <laughs> contact you, right? <laughs> so let's say that together. Give, <laughs> Give me your, your business card, card and, and I'll have, have my lawyer contact you. Okay, and you don't even have to have a lawyer. You're going to then reach out to me or Amit or somebody from CARE or somebody. And then we're going to call them and we're going to say, guess what? I represent this person for this purpose. Don't talk to them. 98% of the time, it's over. They will not talk to you again. They might call me again and say, are you sure you don't want us to talk to them? I'll say, yeah, I'm sure. Bye. That's it. All right. Very rarely it goes beyond that. And Kathy's right, I mean, I'll tell you from personal experience, I mean, that happened many times where um, people that we were trying to recruit, um, we'd go out and talk to them for any number of things. And a few actually understood their rights and they asserted them um, as they should. And we would say, hey, I don't want to speak with you. Um, what's, your, what's your name and information? Um, I'll give it to my attorney. And the attorneys will call us. And it became this dance of, well, do you disclose why you want to talk to this person and show your hand, or do you abandon it? And in every case that I was involved in, we didn't pursue it. Again, because it's, it's exactly, it's a fishing expedition that's being launched to see who can we ensnare, who can be exploited, who doesn't know their rights, who's most vulnerable. And again, being able to assert your rights, assert your unwillingness not to be exploited, recruited uh, by them in furtherance of their operations, they're going to have to try again. And eventually it, it catches on, right? And the community talks. And that courage is contagious. And people realize, you know what? I can tell them to pound sand. I can tell them that we don't want you in our community. We don't need you in our community. We will protect ourselves. And once that happens, then they're going to have to abandon these tactics. You can even record them doing that. Yeah. That was recorded um, in one of the times. Um, and it's gotten out on the internet, and it's a very good know your rights because this person that recorded it did it exactly right. They said, like you said, they didn't even let them in the door. Give me your card. I'll have my attorney contact you. It went on back and forth like that for a while, but yeah. Yeah, actually when, uh, so 2017 was the, the year I stopped working in the FBI, but you know, early, I don't know, maybe early spring, there was an individual in Minnesota, uh, Berhan uh, was his name. And so the FBI had it out for him and they had tried multiple lines of approach. None of them worked, they sent various informants to him try to get him, entice him to say something, it never worked. So they sent me and my partner and said, go out there and interview this individual. Um, and he was a very outspoken advocate in the Somali community, speaking out against FBI entrapment cases. It's a lot of young Somali youth had been targeted under the FBI's focus on Al-Shabaab, um, which then became the ISIS um, cases. And so I went, knocked on his door, and he didn't open the door. And unbeknownst to me, he was recording. And that recording ended up on YouTube, um, ended up all over the internet. Um, it's documented in the New York Times article about me and others have, have seen it. But it's very powerful in terms of giving you an understanding. I mean, this is not, I'm not here again to inflame you and, and to increase paranoia, but this does happen in just documented cases. It's, it's not history. Um, this is the present moment. And I think for us to understand the reality in which we live, we obviously have to understand history as well and act accordingly based on that history. Um, so I won't form this as a question uh, in the interest of time, but I can't tell you how often we hear from people saying, well, I didn't do anything wrong, so what's the harm in talking to them? As I mentioned, the FBI can lie to you, you can't lie to them, 
you may not even knowingly be quote unquote lying to them, but if they see a discrepancy between what you say and what you know, uh, contradicting evidence they can get on you, they can say that you lied to them based on that fact. And so just don't talk to them, period. Also, we hear people saying, well, why would the FBI target me? I'm a nobody, who am I to them? Like, you have actual criminals out there. In fact, that's what interests them, is that you, you, you know, if you're a quote unquote nobody, you know, because the smaller target, the better, as they mentioned here, they're interested in going, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel with people with mental health issues, with cognitive disabilities, because they can get them. It's just about enough, the numbers game for them, you know, how many arrests they can get, how can they continue to prove that there's a so-called terrorist threat, continue to increase their budgets. So I just want Terry to talk about devices. You know, we all live on our phones, our computers, everything. So if you could talk about, um, you know, how we can safeguard uh, with our devices. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, again, you know, our, our phones are our main computers, right? There are storage cabinets full of files, photographs, video, web browsing activity, um, all types of our contacts here and overseas. That's all worthy in the, in the eye of the FBI of being exploited digitally and analyzed for intelligence across the border, again, coming back from Iran, from Pakistan, from Iraq, whatever, that can be searched and you don't have a Fourth Amendment protection, which the Constitution says you have a protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. At the border, you don't have that. So you need to be mindful when you do travel, if you're going to go overseas, go bring your devices or buy a new one, wipe it clean, and just go there for that purpose of maintaining contact when you're overseas. But don't bring the one that you have here and use that because there is, again, no expectation of privacy and they can and will download it. I've been, I worked at the airport in Minnesota. I worked at the airport in San Jose, California, and I was there in the room when a person of interest is crossing the border and they pull them out, CBP pulls them out at our direction and says, okay, we want to download these devices. And it's plugged into a, a terminal, um, and everything is exploited. And it comes back to the FBI and their CD-ROM, DVD-ROM, and then it's analyzed, and it's used in that way. So, you know, just kind of, you know, you have to be situationally aware, right? You know, I, I, again, it's not to create paranoia, but just recognize the threat landscape, recognize the reality that you are behind enemy lines in the sense that your government has deemed you, your community, to be an enemy. It's not justifiable, it's completely preposterous, but that's just the reality based on their historical actions. So if that is their position, what is your reciprocal position? Which I think is to exercise caution, be mindful. Um, there are multiple ways, multiple um, apps now, Signal being one of them, very key in terms of dual encryption. Um, you can't really trust a lot of the companies. Um, if you're exchanging direct messages on Instagram or Twitter, uh, Facebook, because a lot of the executives at those companies are former FBI agents, former CIA case officers, former immigration officers. But there's a revolving door between the two. And so both parties support each other because again, they have to legitimize this entire program. You know, I haven't talked about NSLs and things like that, but you know. Even if that's, even if they don't support it, all it takes is a subpoena from the FBI to get all your private messages mm -hmm. on any of these platforms. As long as if they're end-to-end uh, -end encrypted, then they, they can't get them because they don't have them. But if they have them, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they just get a subpoena from the FBI, no warrant required, they got them all. They use them in criminal cases every single day. I've seen it in my work all the time. So, I, um, um, so I'm gonna keep it really short, um, only because I think we've covered a lot of it. And um, I think our approach has been to take Q&A more because we really wanna know that after hearing all this, um, what, what are you thinking? Is it fear? Is it strength? Is it power? How can we help and how can we get the community? Like Kathy mentioned, 
we won Albany, and Albany didn't have any cases because the community supported the case. Um, and so I think that we really want to know, um, you know how you feel, and I think I'll get to that. But I really would love, especially for the youth, to sort of understand this and young people in our community, because um, you're still you're still uh, um, navigating spaces of you know trust or mistrust or or who to trust and how to see your path going forward as we continue to become first, second, third, fourth generation you know uh, in this country. Um, if you're not from here, is that. Um, a lot of the engagement that happens of, of uh, the, it starts within spaces that are like the school, Islamic school, the masajid, you know, where we're, we have programs in the Muslim community that are specifically tasked to surveil the Muslim community. And they're done very strategically, they're done through grants, they're done through, they used to be done through, uh, like it used to say Homeland Security, now it says FEMA, um, and they are grants um, and I think we have to remember such a basic, um, you know, a, a basic um, rule that there is no free lunch. And so when we sign up for these programs, um, you know, for nice windows and nice doors and nice surveillance equipment, we're, we're exchanging something for it. And that something can be uh, the brother who, who is undocumented next to you, who is special needs standing next to you, who is just financially unstable next to you in this moment of time and we can be playing that role to you know to end his life as it as as it is as, as hard as calamities are um when we're on the outside i i would we would never wish upon anyone to be on on the inside of this this vicious uh car, car sale system so i think um as people in the community if you know you we we own our moss on the side of this space that we all own is the house of allah um, I know there's a board, and I know, but as a community, we can always push back when we invite, you know, police or FBI or Homeland Security or JTTF in our massage to train us. They cannot equip us. Um, Terry, the reason Terry happened is because he wanted to de-equip them, right, and give us information. So there's no way they're equipping us information that keeps us safe. So we can do that job ourselves. We keep us safe. Um, we have organizations like CCF that keep us safe. And so we don't need advice from the FBI on how to not be attracted by the FBI, right? Because that wouldn't make a lot of sense. But the way they sell it, it does make sense or vulnerability or honestly just a masjid struggling sometimes. It's like, you know, you, you just, you want a door and it costs a couple thousand dollars and you want, you know, a system and you want carpet and, and it works because that's the exchange. The exchange is very monetary. Um, and I would love for our community, the word right now on social media, on TV, on the radio is divest. And while it looks really amazing that Colombia needs to divest from Zionism, Masajid and Islamic schools in our community and our spaces need to divest from the security state. Um, and there's a history of that and we need to just follow up on it. Um, and I'd like to open it up now for Q&A. If anybody has any questions. Question for uh, Effie and uh, Terry. The upcoming law that may get passed at the assembly, how can this, is this going to make it easier for the FBI to interact and how would it, and what what types of speech that we've been used to can possibly now be criminalized? It, it technically, it, okay, so the question was this new law, I guess, about anti Semitism, the Anti Semitism Awareness Act that may pass. Um, and be signed into law soon, um, how will that help the FBI to entrap people? Like, they'll use it, well, and Terry can say more, but it's not um, going to actually create any new crimes, but it's going to say that if you criticize Israel, that's anti-Semitic speech, and that sounds bad. So they would, if the FBI has reasons to target you, they'll use that as kind of part of the, the framework of what they're alleging against you. So it'll just kind of add to the case against you, but it won't be a crime in and of itself with that law. Yeah, and, and on that point, you know, um, again, the FBI is very adept at applying pressure 
and, and sort of creating the illusion that something is far more significant than it really is. Coupled with the fact, as Kathy mentioned earlier, about if you, in fact, are deemed to be dishonest and don't fully tell the truth to the FBI, that is a federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 1001. You can look it up. It's called uh, Material False Statements. If you make a false statement to the U.S. government, and that can be the FBI, it could be Border Patrol, it could be immigration authorities, and actually with that too, it's a point, there's no statute of limitations on not being truthful with immigration. So they can use that and apply pressure and prosecute you accordingly. And so as far as with the this anti-Semitism act, right, it's inherently nebulous, right? What does that mean? You know, if, if I sit there based on documented historical evidence and say Israel is a settler colonial state built on the oppression of the Palestinian people, that's not anti-Semitism, but under the law that they're trying to draft and enforce, that could be. And so then they could use that and say, hey, you've verbalized this, you've platformed this viewpoint from someone either in the US, overseas, whatever, and we are going to now charge you. Your back's against the wall, what do you do? How do you respond? You, know, you have to think about that, again, we're in a very emotionally charged environment because, again, this shocks our consciousness, uh, regardless of your faith, regardless of your community. I mean, we've seen such a broad coalition of people hitting the streets, calling for an end to this, this project of Zionist terrorism against the Palestinians. And so I think knowing that reality, we, we have to just be adept at, again, asserting our rights, knowing how to respond. And as Kathy and others mentioned, you know, when in doubt, number one, plead the fifth, which is I will not answer any questions without an attorney present. And if you say anything, this is my attorney's card. That's all I have, I have for you to do. So I think that's the best course of action. Well, you don't even need your attorney's card, just yeah. take their cards. Yeah. Young people, like honestly, I'm like, uh, I'm very vocal on social media, but of course I have a little bit of a edge because I have all these people <laughs> to sort of guide me. But you can be extremely, extremely vocal. Um, Terry sees a lot of my posts, um, and he'll, he'll, he'll laugh. And you can do it without um, being. You know, we live here. We live in the confines of this this border. And we have to recognize what the law deems, um, what they have deemed uh, a terrorism and, and terrorist, terrorist organizations and terrorist outfits. And we have to know the risk that we're taking when we show our support to them any, anywhere. As soon as it comes out of your mouth, it's out of your mouth um, in, the, in the way we live. So you can be all that, and, and, I, and there are ways to be very vocal, um, and you can use words that are not. Hamas, and you know, like you don't have to say the, the words because you know what that means, what, how it's going to be taken, even if your intention is not that. Um, and and you should never ever abandon your ideology for you know for freedom, for ending occupation or injustice. Um, you have to be creative. On that note, also, because um, we, I asked about red flags earlier, um, a lot of it is just common sense. Um, if somebody suddenly starts talking to you about trying to commit a plot or joining an organization that is a designated terrorist organization by the government, if somebody even says, oh, you know, like, we can do this just as pretend or whatever, but, you know, it's, uh, it's clearly that there's a risk for breaking the law. Um, and I say this just for those of you who have sons and daughters to be mindful of, to warn them of these things. Um, last night, Sarwad framed it in a really um, powerful way. Was it you? You were saying about like the, the talk that um, families have to have. So I want you to leave the, the audience with that and if Terry also wants to add to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think we were talking, um, we were talking in the car um, about, actually we were even talking about it on our way home last night that um, it's become a cultural or sort of like a, you know, a rite of passage now, 
black families have the talk with their children um, that when you get pulled over, what is the what is the probability that you know something horrible is going to happen? And I feel like Muslim kids, uh, boys and girls, both need to have the talk of how to use the internet, how to talk to strangers, how to talk to people they've never interacted with, um, because we need to protect them and we need to protect ourselves. Um, I and I can. Yeah, a new friend. Um, I can actually give you a very personal example of someone. I mean, I, I still don't know if they're an informant, but I, I really push people away from them. A few years ago, when I started doing electoral politics, um, there was someone who was always uh, making WhatsApp groups and adding a lot of people to get out the vote. And, and they were, you know, get out the vote, get out the vote. And I, we'd all join. And then he'd message me on the side because I was very active. And he asked me to start compiling a list of names, numbers, addresses, and just data on, on the community. And I would always push back and I would always push back because I just didn't, I don't like the notion of collecting data, you know, because I lived it, uh, my whole life with an extremely high undocumented community. And it's very like, you don't know who, whose hands that get, gets into. And I had my hunch and I'm very like, you know, um, I'm very cognitive of these things. Uh, fast forward a few years, uh, this person now works for uh, the Department of Homeland Security's Division of Interfaith. Um, and he's not a known informant in my community, but what I will tell you is, uh, just recently, I swear, I pray and I make dua that if, if I'm going doing the right thing, Allah push me towards that way. If I'm doing the wrong thing, um, if, I, if I have suspicion, show me, like, give me signs, give me whatever. I meet a girl who I run a, a small women's group with. And I said, how did you find me? And she said, through this person, it was the same person. And she's a pro, she's an excellent grant writer. He, and she wants to help, and he gave her this pitch. And now she's writing grants for all small massages who are first generation, who are mostly blue collar workers, who are cab drivers, I live in the Northeast, cab drivers, limo drivers, undocumented people, and their homeland security grants. She's written for 81 massages in New Jersey. And so, I don't know if he's an informant, I don't know and I can't say that, but the work he's doing is extremely harmful. So have these red flags, question, you know, and, and I'm not saying like, again, I'm very, you know, um, careful who, who, we don't want to slander and we don't want to do all that, but just protect yourselves and protect your community and protect your children and protect the vulnerable around you because it's really important um, to do that. And, and talk to your children about how to handle it if somebody comes up to them and starts befriending them and then starts talking to them about something that's dangerous. Like, let me show you these videos of Muslims being tortured and don't you think we should do something about that and maybe we could do this or that or what do you think, you know, just those kind of red flags because they'll target teenagers or things like that. Yeah, now they have watch parties on Twitch and, and, and whatever. Um, and one case was actually that, you know, um, watching what's happening and then you, you see the rage, you know, come out. Um, I have a 14 year old and it drives him nuts, you know, when he's seeing what, ha what happens in Gaza, but he lives with me. So there's the, you know, there's constant, and give them an, another outlet to express that in a way that's constructive and isn't going to get them in trouble. Maybe attending a protest or writing letters or saying something on social media carefully, you know, getting together with other people uh, in a way that's going to be some kind of terrorist plot or some don't say you're going to send money to somebody who's in Hamas, you know, just do it in a way that's constructive and that is legal. Yeah, the silence of our communities is not protecting these kids. The Masajid's insistence on, oh, we, you know, we're just about worship, we're not political here. Well, the kids are political, as you can see, and they're seeing horrors unfold, and it's been that way for 20 years, and people are preying on that rage and that anger, and so we need to make sure that we can allow them to safely express it, yeah. rather than, you know, trying yeah. to bury it deep. Because yeah, it because... All Right. The if they're not allowed to talk about it, or they're told, oh, don't talk about that, or that's too dangerous, where are they going to go? They're going to go on the internet, and it's going to be a lot worse.
or on the basketball courts where the informants will target them at the gym, at school, wherever. Or our website, uh, www.civilfreedoms.org, you can contact us that way too. And sign up on our mailing list as well.